I came to Christ by hearing God's voice actually speak to me. And uh, that seems very strange to people. But, and it seems strange to me, I can assure you of that. I didn't believe that we could hear the voice of God. Uh, I wasn't taught that way. I wasn't brought up knowing that we serve a personal God whose voice we can hear. There is a scripture that says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I came to an end of myself uh, back in 1980. I was suicidal once again. I was depressed. I'd been there before, you know, as an alcoholic. I was familiar with those kind of feelings. But this time, I did something that I hadn't done in the past. I got on my knees, 11 o'clock at night, and I, I said, God, if you're even real, I don't even know whether I believe in you or not, but if, if, you are real. Talk to me. When I asked that question, I heard a still small voice. It wasn't, hey, hello, Jim, or Mr. Hannah. You know, here I am. I heard that, that still small voice the Bible speaks of within me say this. My son, I want you to get up in the middle of the night, walk across this field out in the middle of nowhere, 30 below zero, full moon, and in the woods in the back, I have somebody waiting for you that can help you. Now put yourself in my shoes. You're out in the middle of nowhere, in the, in the woods of northern Wisconsin. You don't know anybody. You're fearful. You're thinking you're losing your mind. Then I found myself coming around a little bend, and there was a cabin back there that I had forgotten about that I didn't think anybody lived in. As I rounded the bend, I saw uh, two people actually looking out as if they were waiting for someone. I came and knocked on a little cabin door and I said, hello, my name is Jim Hanna. I had tears in my eyes, I was trembling, I was scared, I was frightened. When I said that, the wife looked at me and she said, Jim, we know who brought you here. We've been expecting you. God told us someone was coming tonight. You see, Jim, Jesus Christ brought you here tonight because he loves you. He cares for you. He wants to give you a new life. Would you accept him into your heart as your Lord and Savior? You know, this is just my luck. Here I am in a moment of anguish and, and need, uh, just about on the verge of suicide. And who do I end up talking to? Some radical Christian Jesus freaks. You know, I don't need this. And as I was thinking those very thoughts in my head without expressing them, the, the young lady looked at me as if she could read my thoughts. And she said, tell me something, Jim. Exactly what do you have to lose by accepting Jesus Christ into your life tonight? You now, that question floored me. They weren't charging me anything. They weren't asking for my money. They weren't asking for my, for, you know, to join their church. They weren't telling me their way was the only way. You know something? I realized I had absolutely nothing to lose by praying with them. And perhaps, perhaps everything in the world to gain. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior. And when I did, she said, do you realize now what you've done? And of course I didn't. She says, the Bible describes this experience as becoming born again. You are now a new creature through the power and shed blood of Jesus Christ. And all things are new. You're a new person inside and out.
and God wants to continue to draw you as his son now closer to him and sets you free. And uh, she handed me her own personal Bible. She said, take this home and read it. And as you read it, it will change your life. I took that Bible home and I began reading it. And from that night on, I can tell you, my life's been changed. When I realized that I needed a Bible myself, uh, uh, I asked God, Lord, I would like my own personal Bible. And I would like a Bible picked out and designed and written just ex uh, expressly for me, uh, designed for my personality and the type of individual I am. I prayed that prayer, and as a, as a new believer, new Christian, I went to the Christian store, never been in a Christian bookstore before in our little town of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And I have to confess that uh, it wasn't a very big store, but I was not prepared for what I saw as I stepped into that store. I had told the lady at the counter that I wanted a Bible. And she directed me in this little store to the, to the back of the store. And one entire wall, the entire back wall, was uh, filled with Bibles from one end to the other, from the top to the bottom. And uh, there were King James Version, uh, New King James Version, Living Bibles, Amplified Bibles, every kind of study Bible that you can imagine, devotionals uh, about the Bible, the New Testament, Old Testament. And I sat there literally bewildered in front of this wall wondering, how am I going to determine or choose a Bible? And I began paging through them, and after about an hour, ended up becoming frustrated. Just completely and totally frustrated with trying to find one for myself. And, and I thought, I felt like giving up. And I said, Lord, talk to me like you did before when I first got saved. Speak to me, because I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do. I heard that still small voice of God's Holy Spirit say this, Jim, go home. I've got everything under control. Don't worry about it. Now, I, hadn't, I wasn't expecting to hear anything or something like that. That thought came to me in my mind. I was there to buy a Bible. The Bibles were right in front of me, and I wanted to buy one. After hearing that voice, another half hour, and God reminded me, what she will often do if we get sidetracked, He'll repeat himself. He doesn't mind doing that. He said, Jim, go home. I have everything under control. I'll take care of it. I left the bookstore without buying a Bible, went home, and that next Sunday went to church, to the new church that the Lord had directed me to, and uh, sat in what I call Backsliders Alley, right against the back wall of the church, uh, all the way in the back next to the door, the entranceway, so that if I, the sermon got too hot, I could bolt out the, out the door. At the close of the service, there was a big man sitting up in front of the, uh, right up by the pulpit, all the way to the front of the church. And he stood up, he turned directly around and looked all the way back at, at me. He walked back to me, stood in front of me, looked me right square in the eye, and said this, Son, I want you to know something. This is my own personal Bible. It means a lot to me. And I do not give it out uh, to total strangers. I don't give it out to anyone, let alone a total stranger, someone I don't know or probably won't ever see again, possibly. But the Lord told me to give you my Bible because this is the Bible he wants you to have. I could not believe it. I was stunned because I remember the Lord saying, I have everything under control. It's all right. I'm working things out.
Now I want to tell you, in a sense, the rest of the story about my Dake's Bible. Uh, in 1990, after serving the Lord for 10 years, uh, I was an elder in my church. Uh, I was an evangelist. I spoke at full gospel businessmen's meetings. I was on a journey with the Lord and serving Him with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my spirit. My Dake's Bible went with me everywhere I went, and it was well-worn, and, and I say used and somewhat abused because I'm one of those guys that writes things, underlines things, puts dates beside them, and writes little comments on the, on the sides, you know. And So my Bible had been with me a long time. It was Sunday night, 1990. We were coming home from a church service and we were traveling home on Highway 2 in northern Minnesota, up in the Grand Rapids area where we live. I had a, a station wagon at the time, and my wife was sitting on the passenger side in the front seat. And between us was my Dake's Bible and on, on the seat. And behind me was my 11-year-old daughter, Jessica, leaning over my shoulder, whispering in my ear, kind of just playing games with me and and she would do that once in a while with her arm around me and whispering in my ear and we were joking and whispering when I signaled to make a left hand turn onto our driveway off of highway two. I checked my rear view mirror but I forgot to check that blind spot. There was a semi truck illegally passing us that when I meant to make that turn broadsided us at 60 miles an hour. That crash uh, tore the car just about in half, knocked my wife unconscious, and pinned my daughter and I in the car. The jaws of life came, and they cut us out of the car with her trapped behind me. She was medevac to St. Luke's in Duluth by life flight helicopter. I was taken by ambulance, and three days after I arrived at St. Mary's in intensive care, I was being kept alive by uh, um, the machines there, uh, by life support systems. And I was actually dying, and the doctor stood at the foot of my bed and said to me, uh, Jim, I hate, I, I, you know, we have to inform you that your 11-year-old daughter, Jessica, passed away and died in the hospital. Unlike many people that, uh, pray to live, uh, the most sincere prayer I've ever prayed in my life that I cried out to God for was, God, if you really love me, if you really care for me, let me die. I don't want to live anymore. I did not know what to do. I was very angry with God. I was very upset with the fact that if this is the way you treat someone who loves you and has served you and dedicated his life to you for the last 10 years, then I do not want to have anything to do with you again. And I will not tell anyone about you. Bible, my Dake's Bible, disappeared in that car accident. I figured it was either stolen or burned up or destroyed in one form or another. They found pages of it in the car, in the vehicle, in a ditch because everything was such a mess. But I didn't really care. I did not miss my Bible that I'd carried with me for 10 years of my life because I didn't want to be reminded of all the, <clears throat> the false prof the, all the false promises that it contained and what I thought were literally now lies. 
God doesn't really care for me. God doesn't really love me. Because if he did, how could I be kneeling here at my daughter's grave? At her, I committed my life to God and my children were to be held in the very palm of his hand. And his word to me was, they will grow up like olive plants and be fruitful vines around your table. Uh, and now they are, I was kneeling at my daughter's grave and it just did not compute. A year and a half later, on Labor Day weekend, just before Labor Day weekend, I was called by a friend in Deer River, Minnesota, who said, would you come and preach? <laughs> and I knew this guy, and uh, I said, you know that, you know where I stand on that. I haven't preached since the accident. And I made a vow to God himself that I would never preach again. But I said, I'll tell you, because you are my friend, I will ask God personally what he wants me to do and believe that he will show me and tell me as he always has in the past. I got down on my knees in my little country home up in northern Minnesota and I said, Lord, I'm going to cut a deal with you. If you ever want me to preach again, then the only way I'll do it is if you give me my Dake's Bible back. Now, I knew that was impossible. That was impossible because my Dake's Bible, I knew in my mind, was either burned up, destroyed, stolen, or uh, completely um, hidden somewhere out of, out of everyone's sight or view. But God is a God of the impossible because a couple hours later, a rifle shot was fired in the field behind our house. It was September that time of year. Deer season was about to start. And I had actually caught some poachers and turned them in. Um, and so I said, I'm going to have to call the game warden and report uh, another incident of shooting over here. I called them up and the dispatcher answers the phone. And I said, uh, my name is Jim Hanna. Would you please send a game warden over to our residence? He started laughing on the phone. He says, you are who? I said, my name is Jim Anna. Now, is that a joke or what? He says, well, sir, he says, you don't know us, but this is the State Highway Patrol District Headquarters. When the, the squad cars are rotated and complete their cycle, they're cleaned out, they're washed, and they're resold. Today, in the process of cleaning out one of those cars, underneath the seat, we found a Bible with the name Jim Hanna written on the inside cover. But because there was no address and there was no telephone number and no other contact information, it was passed on down to the afternoon shift and then passed on down by them to me with these instructions. Please seal this Bible up in a plastic bag. Place it in the evidence room which even now I am in the process of doing. And I can assure you that your Bible, if this truly is your Bible, would have sat there forever had you not called at this precise moment in time. Could this Bible possibly be yours? I could not believe it. I said, yes, sir, it is. And, uh, I have that Bible with me to this very day. It reminds me that God is a God of restoration. God is a God who cares for you despite all the hardship and brokenness you experience. God can restore to you those things the enemy has either killed, stolen, or robbed you of. That Sunday, I stood in the Deer River pulpit, and after a year and a half, told the people there, 
something I something I like to tell people everywhere I go. No matter what you've experienced, my friend, God loves you. He loves you. He's your father, and he cares for you. That's something I had forgotten at one time, but I can assure you again, I hope I never will anymore.